Morning Leadership. Eight mentoring sessions you can't afford to miss. The fourth Monday, the do right rule. I arrived at Tony's house before 8 a.m. for our fourth meeting. Jeff, come on in. What brings you here so early? I have a major issue that I need to talk to you about. And I was hoping we could meet a little longer today, I began. Hoping my words were making sense and weren't as garbled as I thought they sounded. I've hardly slept all weekend. And I really need your advice, Tony. No problem. Let me get us some coffee and we can get started. Tony swiftly returned with two steaming mugs of fresh coffee, settled into his winged back chair and said, Okay, what's up? I feel like I took some quantum leap backwards. Since last week, I said, I've completed the Superstar, Middle Star, and Falling Star exercise and found I have been really inconsistent in how I evaluated my employees. Some of my Falling Stars actually have better performance reviews than my Superstars. I also checked the personal file, though I already knew what was there, or should I say, wasn't there. There were no letters of recognition and only one performance improvement documented over the past six months, and it was on a superstar. The bottom line is I've lumped everyone into the middle as far as recognition and performance improvement. No wonder Jenny and Chad felt abused. Now I was on a roll. Discovering what I've been doing is disgusting. I should have known better. Actually, I did know better but I did it anyway. I took a sip of coffee. Then I continued with our team discussion on identifying the main thing. And we did make some progress in that area. Finally, Human Resources is working on finding some candidates to interview as we try to fill those two open positions on my team. The other area that I committed to start working on this week was coaching. Of course, I assumed that coaching for the superstars and middle stars will be positive recognition. I guess my concept was that falling stars were the only ones where I would need to address performance issues. However, I have a major issue on my team and it involves one of my superstars. Here's the deal. Todd has been with our company for four years. He's really good at his job and has a good relationship with all the members of our team. He is dependable, consistent, and knowledgeable. But three weeks ago, I discovered that Todd has been drinking on the job. I talked to him about it and he said that he understood it was wrong. But he was working through some personal issues and was just trying to cope as best he could. I told him that I understood, but using alcohol during work hours is against our company policy and our team's code of behavior. So I wrote him a warning letter stating that the next violation will lead to termination. Well, last Friday I saw him drinking again. I happened to be walking by his office around 2 o'clock, saw him pouring some scotch into his coffee mug. I don't think Todd even saw me just kept walking down the hall. No one else knows about this situation. If HR knew, he would have already asked me to terminate him. To my knowledge, no one on the team knows about his problem. At the same time, I feel for him. I know he's struggling and I really want to help him. Also, I remember what you said about raising the top and not lowering the bottom. If I let him go, then I would have three open positions and I would have lost another one of my superstars, which doesn't help my situation. What I think I want to do is to forget what I saw Friday and just watch to see if he does it again. What do you think, Tony? My mentor's voice was sympathetic. I understood where you're coming from, Jeff. I've been there too. These types of decisions are gut-wrenching and no. I'm not going to tell you what to do. This must be your decision. However, I am going to ask you some questions that may help with your decision-making process. First, 
Does Todd understand the company policy and your team's code of behavior about drinking on the job? Yes, I nodded. In fact, we discussed it in detail in our performance, concealing three weeks ago. And he had a sign, a document stating he clearly understood the policy as well as the potential consequence. Are the policy and your expectations reasonable and fair? Tony asked. Yes, I believe so, I answered. So what if one of your falling stars was caught drinking on the job? That's easy, I said. I would dehire him and move forward. But this is not so easy. Todd is having personal problems, and he's one of my few superstars. And besides, I'd be lowering the top, not raising the bottom. Tony paused before his next question. So what is the right thing to do? I really don't know, I responded. I want to be empathetic and help him, but I know he broke the rules. The right thing to do, probably, is to let him go. But I would be the one paying the price to do the right thing, because then I would have another open position and one less superstar. Frankly, that does not appeal to me. Okay, Jack, let's think about this from a couple of different perspectives. First, you mentioned several times that you would be lowering the top if you let Todd go. I don't agree with you. It sounds to me as though you're using that statement to justify not doing the right thing. And before you say anything, let me explain. Your job is to raise the top for long term, sustain success, not for short term convenience. Short term results are easy. You can threaten people pay them more or just give them what they want, and you can get short-term results. Achieving long-term results is much more difficult. It requires establishing a code of behavior that must be followed. It requires providing accurate feedback. It requires delivering the consequences, both positive and negative, based on decisions that employees make. All of these require courage on your part to do the right thing. People can be superstars in one area and falling stars in another area. You've categorized Todd as a superstar based on your performance criteria. However, it's obvious that he's a falling star based on your code of behavior. So, you need to address this issue as though he's a falling star because that's what he is in this area. Second, I subscribe to the do right rule. Simply stated, do what is right even when no one is watching. Of course, doing the right thing isn't always easy. In fact, sometimes it's real hard. But just remember that doing the right thing is always right. Now, if you don't have a code of behavior or performance expectations, it's difficult to know what is right. In this case, that's not a problem. At least, it doesn't appear to be a problem based on what you've said. Sometimes, it's difficult to know what is right when you're in the middle of a crisis like you are right now with this situation. I have found that the best decisions are normally made before you're in a crisis. You can think more clearly and value alternatives better. I learned this from a friend of mine who is a pilot. He once told me that every conceivable problem that could happen while he was flying the plane had been simulated, documented, and placed in a contingency manual in the cockpit. That manual documents everything that can go wrong and what actions to take if there's a problem. You see, pilots don't make decisions when they're in a crisis. They implement plans that were made before the crisis. For example, if a light is flashing, signaling that there's a hydraulic problem on the aircraft, the pilot opens a manual and finds a procedure for correcting the problem. Then he implements that procedure. It would be difficult for a pilot to think of everything he might need to do while he's in a crisis and the plane is losing altitude, he pointed out. In businesses, from time to time, we see lights flashing, indicating we have a problem. When that happens, some managers will throw a rug over the light so they can't see it flashing. 
In other words, they ignore it. Sure, they may feel better, but the company is still losing altitude. Other managers may unscrew the bulb. No more annoying light flashes. But when they check the other businesses' gauges, the company is still losing altitude. Some may smash the light with a hammer. They may feel better temporarily, but the company is still going down. The only way to fix the problem is to go directly to what's causing the light to flash and fix the problem. Like the pilot, an action plan should have been decided upon long before the crisis developed. If you think about it, you're in the middle of a crisis right now. Lights are flashing and your vision is cloudy. Sure, it's easy to justify going down the least painful path and ignoring the problem instead of doing what is right. But the truth is the problem won't just go away. You have to take action. You have to do what is right and resolve the issue. I read where Confucius once said, to know what is right and not do is the worst cowardice. It sounds as though even Confucius subscribed to the do right rule. But actually living the do right rule is tough because it requires discipline, commitment, and courage. Think about it. My third question, Jeff, is why do you think you're the only one seeing the problem? Many times the manager is the last to know about a problem on the team. What the manager sees is normally a very small part of the whole. It's like an iceberg in the ocean. Above the water, you can see the tip. But what lies below is much larger, much more powerful, and usually much more destructive. The closer you are to the situation, the more you can see. Todd's teammates are closer to this iceberg than you are. And I would be surprised if they're not wondering why you are allowing Todd to do what he's doing. Fourth, everything counts when it comes to your leadership. If you think ignoring the problem doesn't matter, you're wrong. You're always leading, even when you're ignoring a problem. Your team doesn't really care if your company has ethics department or compliance officer. What matters to your team is what you do. And everything you do matters because your team is watching and depending on you to do the right thing. Ignoring issues puts your own integrity at risk. And if you lose your integrity, you won't be able to develop or maintain trust. The very basis for relationships. Jeff, I can't say this enough. You must guard your integrity as if it's your most precious leadership possession. Because that is what it is. But you are the leader here and the choice is yours. Obviously, you have a decision to make. So what are you going to do? Tony's message was clear but difficult at the same time. Okay, I know everything you said is probably correct. I began. But it's hard to do what is right when the pressure's on. I'm not looking forward to three open positions, one less superstar, at least in most areas. And facing Todd, knowing he's going through some personal issues, it's tough. But I know I've been fair, and I know he made the choice to put his employment at risk. And I guess you're right. I'm probably not the only person aware of the issue. I think others on the team are watching me and judging me on how I handle the situation. I'll go to human resources as soon as I get back to the office and I'll get their help in working on my way through this issue. I took another deep breath. Well, Tony, it probably won't surprise you that I already see a place where I need some help from you next week. You mentioned we would discuss hiring at one of these sessions. I think I need to do that pretty fast. Can we do it next week? I've got to make some good hiring decisions, especially now. Wish me luck. Good luck this week, Jeff. And we'll plan to cover hiring next week, Tony said. 
In the meantime, you'll be fine as you work through this issue. Look at it this way. It's a temporary problem. A temporary problem you have to face. I look forward to hearing about it next week. Do the right thing. Develop your action plan before you get into a crisis. Guard your integrity like it's your most precious management possession. If you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.